I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Byron Reese, a serial entrepreneur with a quarter century of experience building and running successful technology companies with multiple acquisitions and IPOs along the way. He's an award-winning author, speaker, and futurist who holds many technology patents and has started two podcasts about artificial intelligence. He currently serves as the CEO of J.J. Kent, a venture-backed technology company that recently launched Scissortail.ai, a proprietary artificial intelligence tool set to inform new product and listing strategies. Bloomberg Businessweek credits Byron with having quietly pioneered a new breed of media company. Financial Times of London reported that he's typical of the new wave of internet entrepreneurs out to turn the economics of the media industry on its head. Byron and his work have been featured in hundreds of news outlets, including the New York Times, Washington Post, Entrepreneur, USA Today, Reader's Digest, NPR, LA Times, and many more. Byron graduated magna cum laude from Rice University with a degree in honors economics and is the author of several books, including The Fourth Age, Wasted, Infinite Progress, and his newest book, We Are Agora, which we'll be discussing today. So Byron, thank you, sir. It is a true pleasure to have you with me today and a genuine honor. I love your work. Going through it, it is an optimistic vision of the future. So thank you for joining us. Oh, well, thank you very much for having me. Well, so today we are discussing themes from your latest book, Agora. But given your incredible background in AI and past background writing on this, I also want to touch on some of your other books because you have many on trends. And again, this is an optimistic, exciting vision of the future. But I wanted to start out as well by asking, given the incredibly rapid pace of current AI development and the headlines that it's been making over the last couple of years, what are your thoughts on what we're seeing in AI right now today? Well, um, like everyone, I think like everyone, I was just blown away by the, um, you know, kind of seemingly out of nowhere, uh, large language model leap forward. Uh, I didn't see it coming so soon. And that is what exponential curves are like, right? Even when you know they are coming, they still uh, gobsmack you because it's like, oh my gosh, where did that come from? Um, so I'm, I'm really excited by it. In fact, um, and we could talk about this. I, I think uh, I wrote, I penned an article called the four billion year history of chat GPT where I think those are, these large language models are the culmination of 4 billion years of evolution. And so it, it, it don't get no bigger than that. Um, but I'm really also very intrigued by the fear that uh, that kind of came with them. Uh, it, you know, when, every, when something new comes out, there's a certain amount of fear, certain amount of optimism. Uh, this one was, I think, weighted towards the fear side. And I spent a lot of time thinking about that. Because when you look at the, um, you know, the letter from uh, Future of Life Institute, you know, say pause all these things for six months, and you look at the thirty thousand people that signed it, it's it's an amazing list of luminaries, and so it would be natural to say, well, if all of those folks are worried, I guess I should be worried too, right? So uh, I guess that's a lot of stuff, but um, I'm excited. Well, again, I mean, there is so much here. Uh, and in terms of your work, so one of the challenges that I had was I started out thinking, okay, I want to touch on We Are Agora because that is a brilliant idea. And we're definitely going to come to that. But then when I started going through your other books, I was like, there's this amazing history of thought trend analysis and prediction, and a lot of the things that you have talked about in your books have come to pass. So let me rewind just a little bit and go back to infinite progress, how the internet and technology will end ignorance, disease, poverty, hunger, and war. This was originally written, I think it was published in 2013. You probably started writing it a little bit before that, right? And it was an optimistic view of the future that proclaimed to end all of those malignant aspects of our world, I guess, using technology. So how have the predictions that you made in that held up over the last decade now that it's been out for a while? It would be tempting to be discouraged when you look at the state of the world now 
and where we are, you know, in 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 the uh, with the internet, which is kind of a metal, which is kind of a, a, a you know a substitute for c- computation in general. Um, however, Infant Progress was a book about the long future, not about the short term, and the more disruptive something is. Uh, the more disruption there is along the way. So it's easy for us to get maybe impatient, and, and it is right that we should do so, uh, with things like where we're at with social media um, and, and the effect it has on society. But we also just have to remember it's so young, it's so nascent, 20, 20 years in. I think Facebook just like three days ago or something celebrated 20 years. Um, and so it shouldn't be all all the kinks worked out by a long shot 20 years into the printing press. You didn't have the revolution that was to come. You, uh, you had fits and starts and uh, you know, they were reprinting anything they could find. They were grabbing uh, classical works and then people are, are like, you know, we need something new. We need something novel. Oh, that's it. A novel. And I mean, that's where that word comes from. They didn't have uh, stuff. To, so, you know, they start printing stuff but not, not necessarily things we still read today. So we're still, you know, it's been part of our life long enough now that it feels uh, like it's been here forever, but it's still, these are brand new technologies. So I stand by everything in that book. I believe it will all come to pass. In fact, it's more than that. I think it's sort of all inevitable that it will come to pass. If you just look at, trends over the last, again, 4 billion years, uh, it, it, I think all of that just logically flows from it. The timing is just frustratingly so sometimes. Well, in thinking about your thesis, I think a lot of it is coming to pass, but uh, what my mind went to was the surprise factor. And actually, the, the one, I wrote this down, but the one that came to mind most was, again, you were talking about increasing wealth, prolonging lifespans, redefining human rights and altering the social fabric of the world. And in terms of human rights, I think one of the surprise factors for me was reading that smartphones have empowered women's education in emerging economies, which is anticipated to help reduce global global overpopulation, right, as people make better family planning choices and they have access to better information and will probably also raise the standard of living around the globe, again, through those same factors. So, you know, this is just one of the few large and unexpected consequences of the internet and the smartphone revolution. And I think most of us didn't really see this one coming, but it is massive and transformative, and it goes to exactly what you were writing about, right? I I think so. it's it's an old cliche that knowledge is power, and it, it really is the power to take control of your life. A person with a smartphone is as smart as that smartphone. Uh, whatever it can do, they can do, and and you know that's just so much more than you could do with without it. And you don't have to think back very far when our ability to access information was uh, highly impeded, to say the least. Like if if you wanted to find out anything. Maybe you could make a trip to a library and maybe you could spend an afternoon or maybe you could find it if it's in that library. But, uh, and now it's, when you think about how, how, how often we search for things now, how many times we ask questions and get an instant answer, that is something that is a habit that formed very quickly that we now take for granted. And that is just more neurons firing of, of you accessing a larger knowledge base and uh it's only going to get more well it, the other part is COVID, right and you were talking about ending disease in that book and it, i mean obviously we don't have a you know a one size fits all cure all for all of our ills but when i thought about the ending disease part i thought about the use of modern data analysis and online communications which helped coordinate this rapid response Mm -hmm. for the COVID-19 virus. And these same technologies also play a pivotal role in the rapid development of vaccines by Mm -hmm. the pharma companies, right? So we have two instances there where, again, you know, it didn't head things off the pass, it didn't stop it instantly, but it played a major role in ameliorating the negative effects 
in the Western world, and I think globally as well. Absolutely. I think it's really fun how our expectations have changed so much. So you remember COVID started in March of uh, 2020, and I got my shot because uh, I'm in a risk group. I got my shot before the end of 2020. I got it December 28th of that year. And so somehow, not only did we have the pandemic begin, and then we all sort of like woke up to it, and uh, then one thing after another, and then it grew, and then it spread, and then they started all these things, and then there were trials, and then there were positive things, and they made the thing, and then they distributed it. And it's really fun because along the way, people are like, come on, chop, chop, get with it, get with it. Uh, yeah. Why don't I have it yet? You know, a, a, a vaccine for a brand spanking new disease by the end of the year. Um, when, you know, back in the day when you got the plague, you just died. That was that was yeah. it. Yeah. That was a story. Um, and, and now we're like, come on, it's been months. Why don't I have this thing yet? They don't have enough shots for everybody. Why not? Um and, and so it's just wonderful that, I mean, that's great. I, I hope our expectations keep rising like that uh, because it just tells you about the world we live in. Well, there were so many different aspects of the COVID you know, crisis. I mean, I remember going on that COVID tracking map. I can't remember who had mm -hmm. that up, but it was um, one of the, the major hospital networks, I think, had that up. And I was on that thing looking, they had identified all of the cases that were reported right throughout the entire world and you could focus in on your area and i did i would go there on a daily basis and say okay you know in this part of my county here is what's going on you know and again that kind of data analysis combined with what you're talking about in terms of you know rapidly getting those vaccines out there just tremendous and it's something that i think we we tend to take for granted because we don't know the details of it but you know, that probably prevented it from becoming another black plague. Absolutely. Now, so looking back over the last 10 years, some of the other changes that we've seen are electric vehicles are becoming commonplace across America. Um, AI is starting to do homework for school children, my school child, which is caused some family debates. Uh, nearly everybody on the planet now has a smartphone. And we've had pioneers like Liz Parrish and Dr. David Sinclair. They have made promising breakthroughs in anti-aging technology. So again, a lot of the things that you've written about in Infinite Progress are coming true. As you've mentioned, these aren't quick fixes. These aren't happening instantly, but they do seem inevitable. It seems like driving th things are driving forward towards them. Um, at the same time, though, we've been through a major recession, we have political unrest, and we've struggled with a growing wealth gap. So I'm wondering if technology is outpacing society's ability to keep up, and can we leverage that same technology to help us resolve some of the social issues that currently seem somewhat intractable? I don't know if... Um... I don't know that uh, I think that technology is advancing beyond our ability to adapt to it because we really do adapt to it very quickly. We all get used to it so so easily. When when you have something, you get used to it instantly, and then you're so aware of it when it when it when it's not there. But these sorts of changes always are disruptive. You know, when the industrial revolution happened. Um, there, were all, there was a big national debate about can you really expect farmers to who work for themselves for the most part, who live by the by the sun, not by a clock, um, who are tuned to seasons and all of this. Can you really expect them to show up, punch a time card and work on, a, on an assembly line and have a boss and, and all of that? Mm. And, and maybe you can't. But of course you can. People are amazing. People are amazing. But uh, it is always, the transition is always rocky. And uh, sometimes, you know, the, uh, the, the changes happen in one actual geographic place to the detriment of another one. And that's why you have cities that blossom and cities that, that uh, seemingly decay. And I'm not really a policy person, but it seems to me, you know, uh, people come together and form governments to, uh, to, to solve communal problems. And those, to me, seem like the exact kinds of things that, a government could be smoothing over uh, better than we're doing now. Uh, if if you just think 
think of it that way is to say we're on this roller coaster and all of this is up and down and all these things are changing and uh, as a society, what's in the collective best interest? Uh, the collective best interest is for everybody to be brought along with it, uh, which will eventually happen. But um, I think policy could uh, ameliorate a lot of the um, hardships along the way in a way that I don't know that we're um, doing a particularly good job at right now. Ah, okay. Well, some of the concepts from the fourth age, which is another one of your books, right? So the infinite progress came out in 2013. The fourth age came out, I believe in 2018. Um, in that book, you made the case that technology has reshaped humanity just three times in history. Uh, the first one was hundred thousand years ago. We harnessed fire, which led to language. 10,000 years ago, we developed agriculture, which led to cities and warfare. 5,000 years ago, we invented the wheel and writing, which led to the nation state. And right now, AI and robotics are leading to another transformation. And the, the ramifications and effects of that are yet coming. You know, we have no idea exactly what's going to happen there. I mean, potentially, we could use that for some of the social issues, right? But could you explain some of the core concepts in, in that book? What inspired you to write that? What inspired me to write it was the question of why do smart people disagree so much on uh, what's going to happen? Uh, why are there those who say uh, AI is an existential threat to us all and we're doomed and invoke Terminator metaphors? And then there are those who say, that's ridiculous. It is going to bring about a golden age of humanity. And they invoke Star Trek metaphors uh, in that world. The the lens I told that story to were the inventions you talked about, and I think that's a very useful uh, way to think about it because it's very real. People can relate to that. But I think if you go one level deeper, I think what's really going on, um, I think what's really going on is uh, our increasing ability to access information. So uh, the thing I hinted at just a minute ago that I was that I'm writing about at the moment. Uh, Light, you know, Earth, Earth cooled billions of years ago, and almost immediately life formed. And that's a big mystery, by the way, why it formed so quickly. And it formed fully developed like we are. And the reason we know that is because uh, you know, you know, you share ninety nine percent of your DNA with the chimp and all of that, but you share fifty percent of it with the banana, sixty percent with mildew. Um, there's only one kind of life on this Earth. It's DNA life, and it's uh, GTCA four letters. It, that's it. That's all we have. And so it began that way. Um, and for three and a half billion years, there was one place to store information, one place, and that was DNA. And it uh, had incredibly long latency. Like you, it takes eons to write something new to it, and but it's pretty reliable. And so, for, but because it took eons to make edits to it, uh, life moved very slowly. And that's why there was only single celled life on this planet for billions of years, because there was only one place to write information. There's a very little information that was on this planet. And then the Cambrian came along, the Cambrian explosion, and uh, evolution created brains. And brains were a second place to store data. And they could store a lot of data, and they could store it very quickly. And they could uh, write new stuff through a process called learning. And then um, along came creatures like us, and then uh, we learned language, which was not only a way to exchange information, exchange data between people, uh, but it was how we organized our thoughts, because we think in language. And kind of the most profound idea that I just think about all the time now is that it may take, it may have taken a creature, let's say there's a poisonous purple berry, it may take a creature 10,000 years to evolve an aversion to that berry. But if I just say to you, hey man, don't eat the berry, it'll make you sick, then you just evolved an aversion to that berry in an instant. And those two things are identical. If I, if you naturally evolve an aversion to that berry, or somebody says that berry's bad for you, and you now all know it's bad for you, those are identical. And one of them happens in the blink of an eye. And so what happens is that that meant human evolution wasn't just what was changed in our DNA, but was changed in our heads. And that is why we evolve by the moment. And, and that's why we're so different from all the other species on this planet. 
because we evolve by just saying something. We don't have to wait 10,000 years for everyone. And so then um, that, fun, that caused all of this great progress of, of humanity. But humans had have a, a flaw, which is you spend your life learning stuff and then you die and it's all gone. And then you, the next generation spends it and learns and then they die. And progress happens relatively slowly because it keeps getting reset every generation. Only a few things are remembered and passed down. And that was a, was a brick wall until we invented writing. And writing was this way that you could externalize knowledge. And there was a third place to store information, not just in DNA, which we still store information, not just in brains, we still store information, but we stored externally in these in, in books. And that, but the instant we got that, 5,000 years ago, you instantly had the Bronze Age. You instantly had this amazing, now all of a sudden, there's history and all of these, this modern world that we live in began in that moment. But that too hit a brick wall. That hit a brick wall because as more and more books accumulated, we put them in these things called libraries and, and they, they filled up and they're very hard to find things in them. It's kind of like that um, that last scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark where they put the Ark away in that warehouse, you know, and it's just gigantic. Um, and that's what libraries are. And so we hit this wall. Uh, but the minute we got like movable type and all of that, you had the scientific revolution because you could access so much more information that you, you had this giant leap forward. And then that hit this wall. Then we learned how to take the 26 letters in our alphabet and use just two, zero and one. And we could digitally encode things. And then all of a sudden you could find stuff in that library because you could search it with something like Google. And that got us to this moment. However, there's a flaw with all of that. And the flaw was that um, if you do a search on Google, what is the difference between a cold and the flu? Google will say, I got 30 billion answers for you. Here's the first. But you don't want 30 billion answers. You want one answer. So yeah. we, we still have all of our knowledge compartmentalized in 50 billion different places. And it isn't consolidated. And that, that is the profoundness of large language models. They are an attempt to consolidate all of human knowledge into a single knowledge base so that you can say, what is the difference between cold and the flu? And all of the knowledge about that is brought together to an answer. And so for the very first time in all of history, we are about to have a, a, a planet-wide uh, knowledge base where we all a brain, a giant planet-sized brain, one brain, one brain with with one set of knowledge that accumulates over time, and as it grows, it doesn't get like a bigger and bigger library. It, it gets smarter and smarter and smarter. And and when you when you look at each of those leaps, they, they give you the Bronze Age and modernity, and then they give you the scientific revolution, and then they give you the digital revolution. This is the big one. This is the big one because you're bringing it all together into one thing. And, um, and, and so you can pick whatever milestones along that way that you want to tell that story. And in the fourth age, I, I picked speech and cities and the ones I did. Uh, but you can pick different markers along the way. But the big story is knowledge is power. And our ability to save, store, and access information is going up beyond exponentially and that it just took a giant leap forward with these large language models. Well, do you think that this giant planet sized brain that you've just described, would that qualify as Ray Kurzweil's singularity? That was one of the questions that came to mind. You, you touched on so many amazing ideas and concepts there, you know, and again, as, as we start to travel forward to, to look at where things are potentially going, I mean, you'd asked like, are people a type of machine? That was one question. Uh, you'd also asked, can computers feel anything? Right. And, you know, even a decade ago for most people, those would have been easy answers. And I think now they are starting to get a lot more difficult to answer concisely. And I'm wondering if, as again, you've mentioned, we have a mountain 
of information that has been compartmentalized and segmented, right? And as we bring that together using AI, we're doing it using tools that function much more like the human mind. So I'm wondering, um, you know, I mean, can computers feel anything today and in the future? And when they reach that point where they start to become more and more like people, do you think that'll be the singularity that Kurzweil's predicted? So you mentioned in the introduction that I had these AI podcasts. And on one of them, I, um, I asked 116 guests a very straightforward question, which are people machines. And the reason that question matters the reason that is kind of the core question is if people are machines, then someday we'll build a mechanical person. And then two years later, it'll be twice as good and twice as good and twice as good. If people are not machines, then, then uh, that there's, there's a gap between what machines are and what people are. You don't actually have to get spiritual. You don't have to say, you don't have to believe in the soul in order to say people are not machines. You just would have to say there is some aspect of humanity which cannot be reproduced in a fab. Uh, and so you don't actually have to get mystical to maintain that. However, that being said, a uh, hundred people I ask, just over a hundred people ask that question, are people machines? And all but three said yes. All but three said yes. You know, and almost like, oh, of course we're machines. What else would we be? I would be the fourth. I do not believe we are machines. I'm not a singularity, and I don't believe in the singularity. But I say all of that because in the world of people who think about this, I have an incredibly minority viewpoint. And so I just want to always stress that, which I'm not saying that, you know, it's it's settled to begin with or that I'm even in in the majority I think it's what, what, what in, I think there's a false equivalence that is drawn between computation. So the singularity hypothesis is that as computers are able to do more and more computations by whatever measure you do, eventually they cross some threshold where they become something substantially different. They basically emulate can either be the brain or the sum total of all human brains or even something bigger. Uh, and then it goes on forever. And then you say, you know, eventually they're so much smarter than us than we are over the ants that, uh, you know, we don't even notice if we're walking around and accidentally step on an ant and it would be the same thing. Um, th that all relies on this equivalency in computation, that that really is our computational ability is what makes us who we are, and makes us different. And, and I don't believe that. I feel that is an unproven assertion. We, we have brains that we do not, um, we don't know how they work. Like if I ask you, um, who was your first grade teacher or what color was your first bike or something like that, you could probably conjure that memory up, even if you haven't thought about it in 20 years. And yeah, we I, don't, was, I was just, yeah, yeah. I was going to say Mrs. Keys and red. Those were my yeah. answers. Mine, were, mine was green. And the thing is, is we don't know how you just did that. There's not a bicycle location and a teacher location in your brain. We don't know how you just did that little little miracle um, instantly, by the way. And then, okay, fine. Then uh, we don't know that. But we don't know something even bigger, which is uh, how the mind comes about. So the mind is all of these things that the brain can do, which don't seem to be what an organ should be able to do. Like, um, you have a sense of humor. Your heart doesn't have a sense of humor. Your lungs don't have a sense of humor. Somehow your brain has one. It uh, can empathize. It, all of these things that we don't know how those came up, come about. We just don't. Um, and so that's the second thing. How does the brain work? We don't know. How does the mind work? How does the mind emerge? We don't know that. And then the big one that you mentioned is consciousness. People say we don't know what consciousness is. That's not true. We know what it is. We just don't know how it can be. What it is, is it's the experience of the universe. You can put a thermometer in water and it will measure the temperature, but it does not feel warm. You get in the, the warm water and you feel warm. And that difference, we don't 
we call that consciousness, and we don't know how it is that matter can experience something. So, given that we have brains, we don't know how they work. We have minds that we don't understand how they arise. We have consciousness, which is a scientific question we don't even know how to phrase scientifically. The assumption that you can reproduce that in a computer, that you can build that out of silicone in a fab, I think is um, the politest way I can say it is it's unproven. But I don't believe it at all. Uh, I don't. I don't think. But I very easily could be wrong. Uh, but well, no, uh, I, I think that's a completely valid and fair opinion. And you could mm -hmm. express that as like a. Well, I mean, some people would say qualia, right? We don't understand what exactly. qualia is, mm -hmm. you know. Or, or you might even be able to say it's like that je ne sais quoi, right? That thing right. that we just can't quite define and yeah. probably never will. Now, I, so I wanted to get into superorganisms also, and this is your new book, We Are Agora, How Humanity Functions as a Single Superorganism That Shapes Our World and Our Future. And for me, this was really exciting because it builds off of everything that you've worked on in the past. And again, when I started looking through your books, I started with Agora and I was like, this is a brilliant concept. You synthesize so many different things together in this. And it builds off of what came before. And that was why I wanted to get into those others. But you started out in this book looking at the origins of life and then the emergence of superorganisms. And if I understand correctly, we human beings are one of those superorganisms, right? We're collections of billions of cells that came together and function as something that is larger. There's this emergent property that's greater than the sum of the parts, right? That is exactly right. Um, a superorganism is a, is not a pseudoscience idea. It's a it's a well established idea. It is a creature made up of other creatures. People often talk about beehives as being one. So we know there a bee is an animal, but what a lot of times people don't understand is that the actual beehive functions as a living creature as well. For instance, bees are cold blooded animals. They do not regulate their body temperature. The beehive does. It's a warm-blooded animal. It does hold its body temperature at 97 degrees. A bee lives a few weeks. A beehive lives 100 years. A bee isn't very smart, but a beehive does all these incredibly smart things about finding a new home and, 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 and so forth. The beehive reproduces the way a life form reproduces. It, it divides in the spring and, and so forth. So it is a, an animal. But then you also have to think to yourself, a bee is also a superorganism, because as you just said, the bee is an, an animal, but it's made up of cells, and every one of those cells uh, is alive. It's a, it's a living creature, and those bee, those cells are not aware of that bee. You know, it's not like they're all like, we're team bee. Um, and so I wondered if people were the same way. So obviously we're a creature. You have a self, and you're made up of all these other creatures who have no knowledge of you. And they, the, the hard thing to imagine is that you say share the same physical space as yourselves, but you are not a cell. In other words, every one of those cells lives their life. And, you know, when you cut your finger and the platelets go over there to clot it, they don't, they're not like, oh, I'm going to go help Tim. Claude is, they don't, they don't know. They just live their lives. They just live their lives. And then there's somehow you, and you occupy the same space as yourselves. You're not a roommate with them. You occupy the same space. So you're a different order of, uh, you're, you're a different kind of order. I guess the, the way I try to describe it in the book is, have you ever seen one of those um, paintings, uh, those photographs of, of uh, let's say it's a, it's a puppy. And you look at it, it's a puppy. But when you squint in and you lean in and look at it, you see that all the pixels are actually photographs of puppies, different puppies. Mm. And they can... So they're, 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 they both occupy the same space, but they exist at these different levels of order. So the question that the We Are Agora book asks is, is it possible that the sum total of humans come together and form an, an animal, which I named Agora, and, but an, not not metaphysical an actual just it's biology that's all it is do they form an animal and is that animal conscious and alive does that animal think uh, and i i write only write books about things i don't know very much about 
Uh, that that is that is the truth. I write about what I don't know much about because my books are all about um, my own journey that I try to share with other people. And so when I started writing the book, I asked that question. I'm a beekeeper, by the way. I, I used to raise bees. And um, and so I asked the question, is it possible that humans come together and form these, uh, this creature, Agora? And uh, I didn't know what I thought. And now I'm very confident that uh, there is such an animal. And I think it is alive. And I think it breeds. And um, I think it thinks. And I think it also... I think it also explains why we are here scientifically. And that's a big deal because science loves, science hates why. Why? Yeah. Science loves how. How did this happen? How does this do? But why? It, it doesn't like why question. It changes the subject real quickly. And I think I can answer why we are here scientifically with this hypothesis, the Gora hypothesis. Well, and Agora in many ways resembles the Gaia hypothesis. But when I looked at your books and again, the scope of your work, it was a short jump for me to say, you know, how does the internet fit into this? Is the internet yet another superorganism on top of Agora? Or could the internet instead be some kind of a, a nervous system for Gaia? Those were kind of questions I'd ask myself. Those are wonderful questions. So you're right. The Agora hypothesis is very similar in nature to the Gaia hypothesis, but they're not incompatible. You see, different levels of order create different beings. In fact, I believe in the Gaia hypothesis. I do. So for th those who do not know, um, it was a, um, an idea put forth by a man named James Lovelock, who uh, recently passed away at 103, um, did not die of old age, interestingly. He was an amazing person. And uh, he said that all of the Earth systems function as a living organism. And that that hold certain values constant at levels conducive to life. So why is it that the salinity of the oceans doesn't change, right? Because every day rivers put more salt in the ocean than the water evaporates, but the salt remains. So why aren't they getting salt here every day? They, they aren't. Um, why is the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere constant? You would think that would be a kind of thing that's all over the map, but it isn't. It's been holding constant for hundreds of millions of years. Well, how can that be? Um, and so he says that the earth functions like a living organism. He was never particularly clear on whether he thought it was a living organism, because I think he would find, I suspect he did think that, uh, but that, that idea might be antagonistic to some people or a stumbling block to some people. Uh, mm. but he believed it was. So to answer your question, is the internet a super organism? Um, Rick Kurzweil, I'm, I'm sorry, um, Kevin Kelly believes something very close to that and he calls it the technium uh which is this cr living ish creature uh made up of all the the world's technology a superorganism is is a life form made up of other life forms since you're talking to somebody who doesn't believe machines can be alive uh then um i don't think it is a superorganism but i would agree with you that it it functions like one Agora is um, just made up of people, of people exchanging ideas and talking to each other. And we're augmented by our technology. We can do more with it. Um, but the biology of it, if you were to dissect Agora, it is just, you would only find its cells are just people. Ah, and those, okay. we, we, we congregate in cities and cities uh, are our hives and they, um, and cities learn and they grow and they can multiply and divide and, and spread and they encode information uh, cities encode an enormous amount of information uh, that can only be encoded by a living in them that that well anyway i'm i'm, I'm digressing no i, I love I, you know, I, I love the agora idea i i think about it every day and i hope it is the um the idea that after I'm gone, that lives uh, beyond me because it it has a very it's it's something more than just knowing it because it has um, it has implications on how you should live your life that I think are really um, really profound. In fact, if I may, uh, may I read about three or four sentences? Yeah, yeah, okay, go, yeah. Me, go for it. One second. <clears throat> 
Well, and, you know, Byron, while you're working on that, I should mention, in terms of cities also, um, I've read that major cities all tend to resemble each other, and it's because they have a lot of the common pressures, right? And this seems like it might go to the superorganism idea. I mean, if you're describing those as basically, you know, organisms created out of living things, you know, they they tend to have the same functionality and they resemble each other. And that's that's something that's been fairly well documented. I think there's a size and scale factor involved, right? But um, someone said, when you go to any major city, beyond a certain point, they've all got the same stuff, right? And you're talking about like, you know, water, electricity, food distribution, thoroughfares, stop signs, all that kind of stuff. So It's interesting. You see, New York City, which is uh, Manhattan, which is an easy one to look at because it's kind of an island. So you can look at it by itself. Um, it has 40,000 restaurants. It has 10,000 tons of food, which is trucked in every day. And you have to say, well, who's in charge of that? Who is it that is deciding what 10,000 tons of food? And there are all these variables. What was the cod catch in Chesapeake Bay yesterday? All these things going on. And the answer, of course, is nobody. Nobody is making those decisions. They're all made from the bottom up. You have uh, 250 different kinds of cells in your body. And those cells uh, together form you. We ha the the U.S. Uh, Bureau of Labor and Statistics tracks about a hundred thousand different jobs. So there's a hundred thousand different occupations in people in New York, for instance. And so you you think of those as a hundred thousand different kinds of cells, and they each operate on different algorithms that are figuring out what they're supposed to do within the context of the kind of cell that they are, and that that comes together. And, and brings in the right amount of flour to make all those bagels and pizzas. And uh, yeah. not all that too much and not all that too little. And it, it, it's also the same thing that distributes all the taxis and Ubers around the city. Nobody's saying, you know, let's put 500 here and 1,000 here and 200 here. They're all reacting to information, just like cells, that come together and um, they operate on their own algorithms, their own functional algorithms, and together they, they bring that alive. And then that city has a memory. It remembers things. That city outlives any of its cells. The city is longer lived than the people in it. Um, it's alive. That's a living creature. That, Yeah, that's a living creature. Yeah. Well, and then through trade and commerce, cities communicate with each other, right? So Yes. There's something called, Yes. I, I go into a lot of this in a lot of detail. Unicolonality, which is the ability. There are like different ant mounds where you've got your individual mounds and they live their lives, but they also trade stuff as well. So yeah. I would just like to read one one short paragraph. It's not much, but it's the last paragraph Absolutely. of the book. It is says, um, if you've ever felt like you aren't living up to your potential or that you should be doing more with your life, I suggest you move past all of that. Remember that no part of a superorganism can comprehend the whole. Agora is far too big for any person to shape or move. Instead, it can only be influenced by small acts of kindness done in great numbers. So put no heavier burden on yourself other than to be as kind as you can be and try every day to be a slightly better person than you were yesterday. That really is all it takes to build utopia. And that's what the book is about. It's about how if we are part of this creature, what does that mean? Like, what what do you do with that? And and how do you decide, like, what to do with your life? And uh, that's what this book tries to do scientifically. Byron, on that note, let me thank you so much for your time today. It has truly been a pleasure. And uh, these are big, big ideas. Well, you know, I, I think people are going to have to kind of go through this a couple of times to really grasp the scope of everything that you're approaching, but it's absolutely wonderful. Let me close by asking, what comes next for you? Do you have another book in the works? And uh, what do you anticipate in terms of technology coming in the next few months as we get a little bit deeper into 2024? I'm not really good with short-term uh, predictions. I, I, I try to I'm a big a big history person, but I'm um, writing another book on AI because so much has changed that I want to um, to think a, l a lot about it. I mean, we didn't even touch on a lot of the. I, I want to write about the fear that I think is so unwarranted. You know, um, productivity tools 
can't eliminate. Anyway, I'm writing a book about AI. Wonderful. Thank you again so much for your time today, sir. Thank you for having me.